Welcome back, warriors. Kwe Tanse Sego Ani Buju. Kwe Nin Deluisi Pam Palmeter, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This podcast is a show about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, while at the same time revitalizing our cultures, traditions, laws, and governing practices. It's also about asserting, living, and defending our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. And that is not an easy job. Our peoples have been resisting state-based racism, violence, dispossession, and oppression. Genocide for literally centuries. We're always working to resist ongoing colonization coming in all directions from all levels of government, institutions like education, healthcare, and policing, industries like the extractive industry, and some segments of society. This means that we have to not only continually assert our own traditional laws, values, and governing practices, but we also have to monitor uh, settler government laws, policies, and practices that have historically and continue to hurt our peoples, our lands, and our waters. It's one of the reasons why many sovereign native nations have spent a great deal of time and effort on the international stage making representations about state-based abuses and breaches of our right and disrespect for our inherent sovereignty and our ability to govern ourselves and our territories. From the very earliest days, sovereign native nations on Turtle Island in what is now known as Canada, like the Kayankahaga as part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the sovereign native nations or tribes in the United States, and many other indigenous nations like the Maori in Aotearoa, New Zealand, have worked at the international level to try to find ways to hold states to account. One of the outcomes of decades and decades of this work is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, otherwise called UN DRIP or UNDRIP, that has been passed by a majority of the member states of the United Nations in 2007. This document does not grant rights. What it does is it recognizes the rights that Indigenous peoples already have to our lands, our waters, and self-determination, and it's considered a minimum standard. After having originally voted against UNDRIP, Canada is now poised to pass legislation, Bill C-15, to start a process to ensure that its laws comply with the rights that are recognized in UNDRIP. And today's guest is someone who has worked extensively at the international level, at the United Nations Human Rights uh, Treaty Bodies, and at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. She is someone who I have always admired, and I consider her a guidepost on issues facing our nations. So when the federal government introduced Bill C-15 to incorporate UNDRIP into the Canadian legal dimension here in Canada, my first thought was, I wonder what Ellen thinks. We don't have to wonder, fortunately, because Ellen has agreed to come back to the Warrior Life podcast and take the time to talk to us about UNDRIP and C-15 so that we can better understand what's going on from a grassroots perspective. Welcome to the Warrior Life podcast, Ellen. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's, it's so great to have you here because I've been wanting to have this conversation with you. I follow all your work. You always seem to be on the right side of protecting our sovereignty, our rights, our territories, defending um, the environment, defending women's rights. And so I care very much about your insight, experience and analysis around this. Uh, but before we jump right into it, uh, for those of you who might not have heard your past podcasts, and if you haven't, go back and listen to them, um, maybe you could introduce yourself the way that you like to. Okay. So the, the core issue about why I invited you here today is because there's a lot of discussions going back and forth 
um, about UNDRIP in general, but more specifically about C-15, the federal government's attempt to create legislation that will mandate a plan moving forward so that mm -hmm. Canada's laws will be compliant with that. And, you know, I, I'm wondering before we kind of get into C-15, if you can just tell us a little bit about the fundamental role Indigenous peoples played in bringing UNDRIP into existence. Yeah, I mean, the UN Declaration was 20 years worth of work by Indigenous people in cooperation with states. Uh, it's an important document. Um, for sure, there were a lot of concessions that had to be made by Indigenous people, as, as were states. And so 20 years worth of discussions goes to show you that this is an important document that recognizes um, the, the dispossession, the historical injustices, um, the, the kinds of ways that Indigenous people have survived genocide in, in essence. So I think it's, it's an important document for us to use in this country uh, to try and gain the respect that is needed, that's sorely needed. Exactly. And for those people who don't really know some of the rights that might be recognized in UNDRIP, could you share just a couple of those? Uh, well, the biggest one that people seem to remember is free prior and informed consent. So that principle that, you know, free means that, you know, there's there's no coercion, that we're, we're, we're free to decide yes or no. Um, it has to be done before anything happens, not like in the process of something happening or after the fact. Informed means we know what those, those, those things, uh, the consequences if we take it and if we don't. And, and the, the ability to, to uh, decide for ourselves, as the Supreme Court of Canada has said, actually, uh, in matters that seriously affect Indigenous people's rights, we have the right to be protected, to have those rights protected. Some people call it a veto, but it's protecting our rights that are inherent to us. So all those things that were destroyed by colonization from our spirituality, uh, our languages, our culture, our medicines, our land, our governing structures, all those things we as human beings on this side of the world, on Turtle Island, um, never surrendered, had, have an inherent right to, to keep and safeguard and to protect. Uh, those were rights that were already granted in other conventions in the UN and the UN declaration just sort of combines them all. Like, like you said at the beginning, it doesn't create new rights. What it does is reaffirms to have that respect for the rights that already belong to us that did not come from the settlers. Well, and that's an important point uh, too that I forgot to mention that, you know, these are rights that we already had. This is a recognition that we have these rights and, uh, you know, from multiple different forums, uh, multiple different declarations, human rights treaties, conventions, all of that. And in fact, the very first article of UNDRIP says very specifically, oh, and by the way, all of the other human rights in the international form were all incorporated in UNDRIP. And yeah. what a sad testament to how states have abused and disrespected our inherent rights that we have to say, oh, by the way, we're also human beings too, and we're also entitled to human rights. Well, it says right in there that we're equal to all others, which means that as, as an equal, equal, equality goes, that, that right was never taken from us. It's been violated. And when we, when we talk about the, the things that are important as Indigenous people, uh, we're allowed to protect them. And I think states who have made these wonderful declarations and com conventions and covenants uh, at the international level uh, are now recognizing that there is a desperate need to for for having respect for indigenous people it's not just in canada but around the world so that that diversity that people always claim is such a enriches society can be protected you know we don't want to be assimilated we don't want to have to have our languages threatened by french or english these colonial languages or our culture that declaration sort of encompasses all those things that we we define as our sovereignty, not the state's sovereignty, our sovereignty. And that's that's really something. It's a major accomplishment. And we owe a lot of thanks to to those people who fought so hard for the declaration. And and their fight was literally an epic one. It wasn't just a matter of drafting it and getting the wording right. That was like, you know, 
the first part of the battle and then the second part of the battle is all of the work, the lobbying, the meetings, the discussions that they had to have with countries all around the world to try to get them to support UNDRIP. And like that is a feat in and of itself yeah. to have the majority support UNDRIP from the work of Indigenous peoples. It shows how powerful we are. And, and, you know, it's now a consensus document at the UN. There's no state that opposes the declaration. And that's, that, again, another level of that accomplishment and the hard work uh, that Indigenous peoples have, have done at the international level. Exactly. And since then, Indigenous peoples have been using and citing and relying on different articles in UNDRIP every time we appear before any of the United Nations human rights treaty bodies, when we're doing reviews of Canada's actions or complaints against Canada, or even at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. We, we've been now for years and years and years pleading it, using those articles, even pleading it here at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, Dr. Cindy Blackstock's case against Canada relied very heavily on international human rights. And mm -hmm. I think that shows a really positive movement going forward about how we can bring that into the legal dimension here in Canada. Yeah, I mean, the understanding that, that we cite articles but as a whole, we use the whole declaration that encompass, that's the shell of all those things that we're talking about in, in creating that protection and respect for indigenous people's human rights. Um, there's, there's so many things in there that, you know, we haven't even begun to start restoring those institutions that have been attacked because of Indian residential school, because of genocide, because of, uh, you know, this, this violation of our inherent rights through development and, treating us as wards of the states. We're not wards of the states. We are actually sovereign nations that have been attacked so severely that, you know, some of us are forgetting uh, and feel ashamed about those ancestral teachings that helped our people survive for centuries. And I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great time uh, to be an Indigenous person in the sense that we have that kind of knowledge about uh, the, the colonial laws and how to use it to have them respect us as they should have in the beginning. And they know nothing about us. It's our, it's our job to say this is, our, this is the institution that we want for education for our children that includes culture, it includes understanding the land, it includes the songs of our people, and so on. And, uh, you know, th these are just words on paper. But unless we actually bring them to life through what, how we understand it and how we want to restore our nations, they'll just remain words on paper. And we're going through these steps right now in Canada to try and implement some kind of legislation, which is, you know, for me, it's not perfect. But I, for me, it's like much better than the Indian Act, which has caused people like me, who is a traditional person under Haudenosaunee law, to have to, to be told consistently by all governments of Canada, including the present government, if you have a complaint, go to the band council. Well, no, I am following the ancestral teachings of the Haudenosaunee people where the women are the title holders to the land. And I think that because it's a patriarchy and our people have assimilated that kind of ideology, that there's a threat perhaps to some people that God forbid that the women get strong. God forbid that the women who we, you know, we've thrown tokens uh, of allowing them to have certain rights. Uh, God forbid that they get even stronger and get, you know, young men to assimilate and say, respect for the women means respect for the land. And we have gone far away from those teachings simply because in our survival mode, we have forgotten that. And I think we need that time to discuss amongst ourselves. But in the meantime, the world, the world will go on. We can have these discussions, but the world will go on and we need to, to put like push back. And I'm the first person to say, I distrust Canada. I distrust its laws because right now they suck. They do not defend our rights. This is something that could actually give us that momentum that is needed, that have generations have been asking for to push forward and say, you, have, you want this as, as part of your law. And we, we are happy uh, that you are embracing the fact that we should have had this equal relationship centuries ago. So let's, let's begin that process because reconciliation has never even taken place. No, and the issues that you're talking about 
what's what's unique about UNDRIP clearly because it was pushed and drafted by Indigenous peoples, is that you see the combination of all of the recognition of these things together. So a recognition that all of our traditional territories uh, are ours, that our traditional governing practices, our traditional laws, how we want to be represented even, you know, is, is these are rights that are protected. The fact that there can be no discrimination against Indigenous women is protected. The fact that we have to sp take special attention to protect the interests of our elders, of children, all of these things, you don't see them in, you know, other documents and laws in Canada as profoundly as you see that all coming together mm -hmm. holistically in UNDRIP. And the other really important thing about UNDRIP is that it says, and by the way, nothing in UNDRIP can ever be used to abrogate or derogate from any of your treaty rights or any rights that you have. So even under foresaw that maybe a state would try to use it against indigenous people and said nothing in under can be used that way. No, no. And, and you know, when I think about our ancestral teachings, I mean, think about the seven generations from now and what kind of legacy that we're going to be leaving behind. We include in that uh, our efforts for climate change and I know a lot of people who are at the grassroots, who are, are being criminalized um, and have, you know, like myself, we've we've suffered a lot over these these few decades um, being ostracized or, or whatever, because we're not towing the line of the colonial box of what is a good indigenous person. Well, this, this land of ours, uh, you know, I'll talk as a Haudenosaunee woman, uh, we're supposed to be protecting that land so that future generations and the ones who are babies now and, and, the, and the children and youth, they're going to be able to enjoy that land. And as we see development just chomping at, you know, taking chunks of uh, and denying future generations of enjoyment of that land, um, the efforts that we are putting through, if this legislation is going to be able to help, then then why would we not want to use it? Why would we say that this is this is something that it's not? As as a person who's worked in human rights for for these past few decades, I can tell you that we, you know even if we go to the courts today to try and stop things, there's so much political lobbying. There's so much you know. Let's let politicians think about the next election. This is a law, you know. So whoever comes in next. They can't change that. They can't say that, no, Indigenous people don't have the right to do this. This is going to be in the books. And this is where we can use this to our advantage to put forth uh, that protection for the, for, and, and the legacy that we leave behind for future generations. And all of this is thanks to the work of Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples have never sat back during colonization and genocide and dispossession. All of us all over the world have consistently resisted and fought against that and asserted our own rights. And so here's UNDRIP, you know, which has so many different important articles in there that really talk about recognition of, of literally every aspect of our lives from language and culture, the economy, education, um, like all of it and, and basically control, you know, over our own territories. And, you know, for people who don't know the history of UNDRIP, there were four states and I bet you could name them even if you don't know the history that voted against UNDRIP when it yeah. was put forward. You know, not surprisingly, Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Why is that? Because those are colonizer states that are on 100% indigenous territories. Yeah. And so, you know, lots of things have changed since then, but that wasn't just because they decided, you know, to be good one day again, that was from consistent pushing by Indigenous peoples to adopt UNDRIP. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it changed the perspective of states in the sense that they understood that the, the plight of Indigenous peoples um, as sovereign nations, you know, as, as peoples with the S, the right to self-determination, um, that, that simple S was fought for <laughs> for a long time. Imagine that. like. Um, we cannot dismiss 
the work that has been done, we cannot reject something that could possibly help us get out of the Indian Act. And, you know, at its core, the UN Declaration is about respect for Indigenous peoples' rights, our human rights. And we don't have that right now. We don't have that in Canada. There's a lot of states that don't have it. It is, but it's an international human rights norm. And we need to, we need to find something better than what we have today. I, I, you know, I can't, I can't imagine, uh, you know, the next year of people continuing to take our land and we're going to be standing there. The few who are brave enough to stand at the front lines to say like, we're not, we're not budging and then get brutalized, A, get brutalized by, by police authorities and then get criminalized have to raise money and go within a court system that says that we are wards of the state, that Canada's sovereignty is the the, the law of the land. Um, and, and, you know, if Canada was held to the standards that is in international, at the international level, uh, then we would be far further ahead. Right now, we're just sort of talking about it abstractly. But when I think about the time that the UN Declaration was actually passed at the UN, we've come a long way in changing the mentality of many states. And that was like, I don't know what, 11, 12 years ago. Uh, and we're still, we're still trying to push that. And these are just tools. They're just tools. Nobody is selling out. Everybody is looking that we are under duress. Give us something to work with, because what we have today in regards to uh, Canada's constitution or the laws of Canada and its provinces, we don't really have anything to work with. It doesn't recognize our self-determination nor our sovereignty. No, and we have to do something to crack that really skewed rule of law, which only looks at Canadian laws and completely disregards our laws, our rights, these international human rights. So here we are in 2021. We're now at the third official attempt to have Canada pass legislation to incorporate UNDRIP into domestic law. The first attempt was by Cree NDP MP Romeo Saganash's bill C641 that was introduced in 2014, but that was defeated at second reading. Then Romeo introduced another private member's bill, C262 in 2016, but that didn't make it to the third reading before the election in 2019. So this time around, Trudeau's government introduces bill C15, uh, an act respecting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And it was sitting at second reading and they just voted to end the debate so that it can go to the committee stage. That's the latest update as of today. But at the, while all of this is happening, you have some groups who always oppose native rights. So you've got groups like conservatives, some of the provinces, the extractive industry, and some academics who've long held racist views about native peoples all speaking against just how awful this bill will be. How much do you think that their op opposition will impact whether or not this bill passes? That's a good question. I, I'm not really sure. Um, I, I do know that this is like a double standard. Uh, their opposition is a double standard in the sense that, you know, and, and it's very imbalanced. Like we're going to protect economic laws or economic policies uh but not we're not going to protect human rights we're going to protect economic policies but we're not going to protect the rights of the environment so that we can poison uh the water that our people drink and shower in and it's not just indigenous people it's just everybody's and so there's a re really really skewed view uh of what law or the rule of law is um I, I, I like the expression of the, you know this ever-growing tree of, of life, um, which is parallel to what the Haudenosaunee believe too, that you add to the rafters. So you're adding to the rafters to put into context laws uh, it, of, of the times that the people are living in. And I think that these conservatives um, should be called out for their racism. You know, we can make a human rights complaint against them. But at the end of the day, it really is about education. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission talked about education right across the board. We talked about Aboriginal, about the Truth and um, 
the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women, how much more evidence do you need that a genocide has taken place? How much more evidence do you need to the fact that Canada's, the state of Canada, tried to annihilate Indigenous people? This is not, this is, I think this is really selfish. And I think people uh, who think that this is acceptable um, should be called out for their racism, just like Lynn, Lynn Bayek did. You know, we, we, we called her out. It's not acceptable anymore to have these racist views in, you know, with this profession of that, that, that professing to say, oh, we're protecting our economic rights. You're not protecting our, our economic rights because it has been at the blood and, and, and tears of Indigenous people. They've been destroying uh, uh, who we are because we're people of the land, right? And there's nothing that they can say that would convince me. Um, and it's time I think Canada really addressed the issue of racism within its laws and within society in general. It's got to, it's got to stop. I mean, we, we saw the numbers protesting for George Floyd. We saw the numbers protesting for Joyce Ashaquan. Um, when, how many people have to die before people like that, uh, that we can, we can silence their voices and not have them influence um, the day-to-day -day laws or the day-to-day -day living of Indigenous people or people of colour, Black and Indigenous people of colour. Well, exactly. And I find it both repugnant, but also very illustrative of how normalised anti-Indigenous racism is in this country at all levels, like in our laws and governing systems, that you would even allow people to debate indigenous rights mm -hmm. or to try to limit it in their own self-interest like it's not a debate UNDRIP has recognized we have these rights like this is the international minimum standard the fact that you could bring people in to testify about why it's not or um how we should if it passes it should be in a limited way what they're basically telling you is we're only okay to recognize native rights, as long as it doesn't impact the status quo of ongoing genocide and our benefit from yeah. the dispossession of our lands and resources. I mean, it makes no sense. Why would you invite a mining company to come and talk about indigenous rights? They don't have a right. I mean, they, they, they're not even following that. And I, you know, I, I was thinking as you're talking, I was thinking about, you know, this past summer, where you know the statues of, of Sir John Macdonald were taken down, that that people, you know, a hundred years over a hundred years later, are calling out these racist acts that have influenced the, the the very lives of Indigenous people, and that you know you may think that you've got it made now, but somewhere down the low the road, and I see that in the youth that are changing, not just Indigenous youth, but indigen but youth in general, they're fed up. There was a survey done in, in, in Quebec last fall where you could see the age gap. The older guys are saying, you know, yeah, you know, we think we, we think that, yeah, they've been given a, a bad a bad rap. They've been given uh, a hard time. Where the youth are saying, yeah, we're fed up with the older people. We want change. We want to stop the racism. We want to stop the, the, the femicide. We want to, we, they want change. And so these, these old cronies who are relying on the status quo of, of a genocidal uh, society, um, you know, based on, on genocidal laws, um, they're dinosaurs, you know, people are becoming more enlightened. And if they want to have, I think the thing is, if they want to have uh, and continue to be politicians, they're going to have to start listening to the youth. And there is a way in sustainable, a sustainable way of life, uh, as we have seen, uh, you know, sustainable energy has created more jobs than the fossil fuel in industry. That's that's going out the door. We want to be able to provide some kind of hope um, for the children and youth because the UN has said six years, we only have six years left to actually do something to really change what's going to come. And you know, and I and I always refer to him, Thomas Banyanka, the late Hopi elder, who had addressed the UN and he said, like, we don't want power. We just want you to see that what you're doing now, you're not gonna be able to stop. What you have to do now is to help and teach your people to survive. If we can provide something where Indigenous knowledge is at the forefront of the solutions to climate change, then the UN Declaration 
can be that because it respects our right to self-determination. It's not saying let's bring in the colonial box in a form of governance that provides services but has no power. No, it's saying you have a right to self-determination. That means you have a right to know and to decide what happens on your land. And this is what I think people are missing in this, this legislation. And I think it's important to have forums to be able to talk about this because, you know, we know there's the usual set of characters that are always against Native rights, you know, the super, you know, right wing conservatives, extractive industry, people who are making billions off of our territories and also off of our suffering of all the murdered mm -hmm. and missing Indigenous women and girls and kids in care and over incarceration. And then there's, there's, you know, Indigenous peoples having this discussion. So, you know, over the last few months, we've seen some very um, passionate people who are very uh, supportive of C-15, not C-15 in and of itself, mm -hmm. but taking steps to implement UNDRIP into law here in, in Canada, creating a path forward. Some of those proponents are ones who uh, have actually took part in actually creating UNDRIP along the way. Uh, people like Romeo Saganash, for example. Others may be in political positions or in advisory positions saying, look, we've, based on our review, we think that this is a tool. It's not perfect, but it's a tool going forward. And then there's others uh, in the Native community who see this as a Trojan horse, that this is just a way to make uh, to hurt all of our laws, to hurt all of our treaties, that it hurts our sovereignty. And um, so I, I'm wondering if you could speak to, you know, some of the issues that people have raised around what their concerns around UNDRIP are, maybe some of the misconceptions about what Bill C-15 does and doesn't do. Well, it, it'll definitely, you know, bring about that respect that we've been needing and i and when i say respect because people i've heard you know like mark miller's like, oh, we recognize you know or justin Trudeau, we recognize indigenous people i don't want you to recognize my right i don't need your recognition what i need you is to respect those rights and this is what i think bill it's it's a step forward it's not perfect it's not it's maybe it's not all the things that we want but when do we move forward how are we going to move forward under the indian act how are we going to move forward under Canada's Constitution Act? It's not there. So if you have a law that specifically is talking about respect for the rights to self-determination of Indigenous people, couldn't that be a positive move forward? We're not going backwards. We're actually moving. Might not be as big steps as we like, but it's a, it's a positive move forward. And then you could have something that has like an adjudication uh, review committee that has Indigenous peoples in there who can actually work to try and lift those provincial laws because we can't forget about the provincial laws. They're, they're also problematic. Um, and we're going to have traditional people involved. All the traditional government and representatives will be there. Um, we, we, are, we are left out. We are ignored. We are dismissed. As, as traditional people because we don't want to go under the Indian Act. And, and um, you know, this has been a divide and conquer um, strategy for centuries. Could this not actually be a forum just to kind of you try and unite people for a little while to say that this wonderful 20 years in the making uh, declaration can actually become part of the law in, in the land that we're living in? Um, the dispossession will continue, uh, and this will will put, like put the brakes uh, on on some of those development. We're dealing with urban sprawl. We're dealing with toxic waste dump, uh, and it's by people who do not respect their own ancestral teachings. We want to be able to protect the land, and I think that's that's foremost in most Indigenous peoples' philosophy of what self determination or sovereignty means. Uh, it, it, it will address the violations that people have suffered because of colonization. Um, we're talking about trying to make positive change. We're always talking about we want, we care about the children. Well, how can we do that when the existing laws don't protect our children? How can we do that when the existing laws continue to allow land dispossession? And if we're not going to, if we're not going to take this, when is the right time? 
what will be the most perfect situation? It's never going to happen. And as time progresses, we're losing more elders that understand the language of the land. We're losing more elders that have that cultural experience and that historical experience. And if we're not going to be teaching our children, and we're just going to let them assimilate completely, uh, then there's no use in having a declaration, as far as I'm concerned. Here we are, we can put this into the curriculum of the schools. You know, this is the, what the TRC is talking about. This is a law, putting that into the curriculum so that we don't have those, the, you know, the Canadian Taxpayers Association saying, Indigenous people don't have a right to do this. It's like, you know, these, the doctrine of discovery has, is, is, has never been repudiated by Canada. This will allow uh, and, and put Canada's feet to the fire and say, you've repudiated this doctrine of discovery. So you have to see us as the declaration says, equals to you. We are not under you, we are equal to you. And I think one of the most profound things about UNDRIP, aside from the fact that it was at the initiative of Indigenous peoples worldwide, that all the hard work that went into it was Indigenous peoples, is that it is 100% outside of the Indian Act, and it is 100% outside of Canada's Section 35, which, as you know, had the potential to be a positive thing, but has really tried to limit our rights and empower governments. UNDRIP is outside all of that. And basically, it's like UNDRIP says, you know, no matter what's in states, the minimum standard that is recognized by the majority of member states around the world is, yeah, you own your lands, you get to govern yourself, you get to choose your own representatives, all you get to revitalize all of your customs, values, languages, traditions, you get to manage your own resources, develop your own institutions as you want to, and the government has an obligation to provide the ways and means to do that. They have to make sure that, you know, we get the funding to do all of that stuff. We get our lands, we get our resources, which would make us sustainable. And I think the fact that it's outside of Canada's problematic laws mm -hmm. makes UNDRIP so significant. And you could make the same argument. You know, the tribal governments in the U.S. are saying, you know, UNDRIP is outside of all of the problematic laws and court cases that happened in there. It's the same in, in Aotearoa for the Maori or sovereign Hawaii. And, you know, I, I, I want to talk to you about the article that you wrote um, for Ricochet Media. It just came out a few days ago, and it's called Bill C-15 is a chance to actually break with the colonial status quo. Mm -hmm. And the very first, you know, comment that you make in that article is the fact that your support for Bill C-15 is not based on any blind faith in the Trudeau government. Like you're not thinking, oh, I completely trust that they're just going to do everything perfectly. That this is really about what you were saying, using it as a tool. And I'm wondering if you could just kind of expand on that because your article was really profound in that way. Yeah, I mean, I've listened to the people pro and against and I'm thinking um, as, as a frontline activist, who has experienced really like on, on and every every side um, a barrage of, of hate or um, extreme support? Uh, part of part of the problem we have as a, as frontline uh, activists is to be have to be able to have that protection. And so when I see that Bill C fifteen is there is actually. Uh, something that we can use as 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 a tool to to defend our rights and, and and an argument to use that perhaps we don't need to go to court anymore to protect our rights that that, that there's going to be restitution that there's going to be ways in which there's a framework to 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 implement the to to implement the declaration then I think about time I can breathe. You know, it, it's it's tough work to be to be out there and to to work against the status quo that is within Indigenous communities itself. Um, it, you know, the UN Declaration as a framework, as I say, and I hate to say this word because we don't like it anymore, reconciliation. Um, but it's also a framework for us, for within our own people of reconciliation, and to talk about, uh, you know, you can be Christian, you can be Buddhist, you can be anything. But as an indigenous person, 
this is this is the baseline. This is the baseline of self determination. We we don't we don't want you to 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 exit whatever faith it is you think, but this is what it means to be an indigenous person. It's all in the, in the declaration. It talks about those things that were taken from us, and I don't trust the government. Uh, I think they haven't been a friend to indigenous people, and it really surprises me. Uh, but I think it has been years and years of lobbying the government to actually put their put their money where their mouth is and talk about, do you respect Indigenous people's rights? Then you should be implementing the UN Declaration. And this is an effort. It's a beginning. It's, it's, it, laws can be amended. And, and so if we are to um, throw away this opportunity, uh, I, I think we would be wrong. It would be a mistake for us to throw away this opportunity simply because we don't like the Canadian government. I think there's there's stuff about the UN Declaration that is going to be implemented uh, that we can use. And um, my goodness, do people really want the Indian Act? We've been talking about getting out of the Indian Act and here's here's something. It's like it's, it's not what we want is it completely. But my goodness, we we're, 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 we can go somewhere with this, and we don't have to always be doing blockades. We don't have to always be out there in front. We can be home with our families and enjoy them. Um, but this is uh, for sure. Um, like I say, we can put words on paper, but until we bring them to life, they will remain words on paper. And I think your words are really important, Ellen, because there's a multitude of perspectives and, you know, our, our traditional teachings, while they vary from, you know, Gayankahaga, Mi'kmaq, Wet'suwet'en, Shekwepmik, um, we seem to have this common thread where, you know, historically, according to our traditional laws and values, everybody's perspective was valuable, everybody's mm -hmm. perspective was heard, it was valued, it was considered, and th that's how we arrived at decisions, that it was, you know, people talked about, here's what we think is good, here's what we think is bad, and, you know, made the case for all of these things, but always within the context of our traditional values and principles, acknowledging and respecting the voice and perspective of someone else, and vice versa. And I think, to me, that that's, that's really, really important, especially when it comes to things like this that could be uh, potentially helpful. And I, and I wanted to ask you because, you know, you, you're a grassroots warrior and you've been, you know, you are at the, the siege of your territory. People call it the, you know, the Oka standoff, but, you know, literally the military trying mm -hmm. to subdue um, Guyankahaga people. You have been a leader at, you know, Quebec Native Women advocating for, the rights of native women. I mean, you've been you've been doing it all and you help mentor people like me and others behind the scenes. And you know, most importantly, you've been on the ground. You're one of the people on the front lines and I think the people on the front lines, their voice isn't listened to enough in all of this. The default in Canadian politics is well, you you talk to a national aboriginal organization or you talk to an elected person, but you don't also take the time to talk to the people on the ground who are suffering the day-to-day -day impacts of trying to protect their lands and waters, trying to protect their sovereignty, trying to keep women safe from mm -hmm. all of the violence, trying to keep their children at home and not in foster care. You know, the people that are living on the streets, all of our people who are incarcerated, where are their voices? in all of this because many of them have perspectives that they uh, want to share but are fearful of the people's reaction and so what i really wanted to talk to you about is you know we all care so much about protecting our rights how important is it that native people are able to share our perspectives our thoughts our analysis on this bill or anything else for example based on our knowledge, insights, and experiences that's in an honest and open way, but in a respectful and safe way too. Yeah, I think I think this is this is one of the reflections we have about how colonized we've become. Um, you know, as a frontline activist, you know, we we are ignored, as I, I said earlier, we're dismissed. And and the declaration is 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 saying that 
everybody who everybody who's a stakeholder, a rights holder, is going to be involved in implementing uh, the the UN Declaration. States can't just say this is how we're going to do it. It's going to be indigenous people, not just Assembly of First Nations or band councils, but traditional people. And I think we've become. This is one of the impacts of of colonization and trauma, which is don't speak, don't tell, uh, and don't feel. And I think it's time to turn those tables over and to say, yeah, I want to speak, but to speak in a respectful way. This is this is something our ancestral teachings have taught us. Do you speak in a respectful way to 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 show your opinion? Um, uh, our people used to have the same language, understood the same laws uh, that we had. Um, you know, this common understanding of what it means to protect the legacy and future generations, their rights. We all had that common understanding. Nowadays, we've adopted the values of the colonizer, which is economics first and, and our rights later. Uh, so I think it's time we get out of that fear place and, and, and know how to express ourselves in a respectful way, to be able to agree to disagree and still shake each other's hands or still hug each other and say, okay, I respect your opinion, but not the social media stuff where you're calling down people. That shows that you're not actually part of that, that indigenous teachings and that, that way of understanding. It's one thing to say, you know, Mr. Miller and, and Canada, you have not respected our rights. You have committed genocide. Uh, but as indigenous people, we, we need to break that cycle of divide and conquer and have a safe, a safe forum where we can discuss but to be informed, this is a free prior informed consent stuff, like to be informed, to look at what is laid out in front of you, just as our traditional teachings say, this is, this is what's laid out in front of you. How is your mind interpreting that? And when you speak about it, then you're able to see, okay, did I, did I just say that? Or I, I think I'm right. Um, but in a way that has a, that brings us together rather than divide us because the colonizer has wanted to divide us for so long and they've, they've been quite successful at it. So let's bring about those teachings and we can use the declaration in parallel to those teachings. We don't have to separate ourselves from our traditional teachings and our laws uh, to use the declaration. We can incorporate all those values because we're living in 2021 and we're living in a pandemic and we got we gotta do something because you know, we're losing our land every single second that, that we're here. It's just so important. And one of the points I really want to reemphasize about what you said is that it, it is important for us to call out and critique and demand better from those that are in power, like those that are in elected positions or the prime minister or any of the premiers in the province, because they're in those positions where they hold power, they wield power, they have the legal obligation to uphold our rights. So yes, we should call them out. Um, and, but at, you know, as between us, when we're having conversations about this, the idea isn't to call one another out well, it's to hear what you have to say, hear what I have to say, and take it into consideration. And it's okay to disagree, and mm -hmm. still be and still be respectful. We never agree with everything we always say. We come from different nations. You yeah. know, Canada's tried hard to make Canadians believe we're all this one mythical race of Indians, and so there should be one Indian who speaks for everybody. And that continues to be the way how Trudeau has you know, created this nation to nation relationship with the AFN and them. And the AFN is a, a political organization. They're yeah. not the Indian they need to be talking to. You need to be talking to the sovereign peoples, the sovereign governments, you know, on the ground. And so, you know, I just, I too, and it's one of the reasons why I invited you here because you always share your perspective in a kind and thoughtful way and in a way that respects people who may disagree with you. And, but, but we do it in, you know, always based in that those cultural teachings, I think is, is so important. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Ellen, like, before I let you go, like, wh what is your dream for us going forward? Like, what would you like to see happen on a go forward basis that could help really change things for us on the ground here in Canada? Well, I think... You know, I, ideally, uh, we would change the education system. We could bring, we would bring in all our people, um, the elders who have those teachings, some of the elders who have the language but not the teachings, uh, bringing in those perspectives of how we can keep our people safe. Uh, I think safety is a really big issue in our communities. 
and to be able to say things safely without fear, you know, keeping one eye open as you sleep. Uh, that's a that's a reality that we have in our communities because of the corruption that that exists. So the the ideal place is um, to be able for for people to be given those teachings to understand that when you do something, you do impact the lives of other people around you, and in fact, in your whole community. Uh, to be able to protect the land and to protect the waters that we depend on, to protect all those things, uh, all the the creatures that live in the water. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the trees and then the trees, you know, like as, as one scientist said, has the same DNA as us. The stars have the same, same DNA is in us to look at the, that our ancestors' teachings and those stories that they told us actually have a scientific basis in how we are supposed to see each other as, as related, as, as part of that universe. And um, I, I want to see an end to to the, 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 the huge consumerism that we see destroying this planet. I, I want to see an end of fossil fuels, but I also want to see uh, sustainable energy being accessible for our people. Um, and I'm really glad that Indigenous people were given the, the front line for, for vaccines. Um, but it has to go deeper than that. It has to, it has to resonate in our daily lives and it has to resonate in how the earth is treated and, and all those relations that we talk about in Ahandal Gardi with Echo, you know, the words said before all else. It can't just be a speech. It needs to be actually be absorbed into our bodies, into our minds. And, and uh, I, I mean, I have a lot of hope. I mean, there's wonderful young leaders like yourself. Uh, you're doing such wonderful work, Pam. I, I know that uh, I really, really appreciate what you said to me at the beginning. And uh, I admire and respect what you've done uh, to teach people. We need more people like you to teach. We need more people like you to be out there to say, I'm going to listen. And, and I, I, want to, I want to know. I want to know what's, what's really going on instead of making a judgmental decision. So um, my hope is that the youth will be able to find a way that our generation couldn't and that uh, we're going to be leaving them something that they can live with and, and work with rather than what we see today. Uh, we have to stop bickering. You know, that we talk about in the, the great love piece, um, the state of mind and how, what it means to have peace. And it's, it's a challenge. You know, we can't say, oh, I'm, I'm peaceful every day. I'm not. You know, there's things that I worry about. There's things that I'm, I'm stressed about. But it's trying to find that peace. And if we can find that peace, maybe we can find the respect. And maybe we can find the courage to say, uh, I respect your right. Um, I was wrong. Or uh, can you listen to me? I, I just want to sit and have a discussion with you. That takes courage to do that. And uh, you have that courage, Pam. So I'm really quite honored to, to be on your show. And uh, I'm quite honored for the words that you said at the beginning. Um, there's so many great indigenous people out there and I wish we could all get together to, to protect this beautiful, beautiful uh, land that, that was given to us by our ancestors. Thank you for that, Ellen. That, that means a lot to me coming from you because like I said, I've, I've admired you my, my whole life watching what it was you're doing and every time I listen to you, I learn something. You know, we never get to a state where we know everything. You're in a constant state of learning and just today how you reminded me to also center all of the other living things. You know, right now it's human beings having this conversation. But what UNDRIP has the potential to do is to recognize and provide protection for our traditional laws and governing practices, which includes respecting all of the nations of the other living things, all the plants and animals and, you know, the spirit world and all of these things that often gets overlooked when human beings are, you know, talking about what's right and what isn't. So, you know, mm -hmm. th thank you for that, because UNDRIP is also about protecting the planet, in fact, <laughs> and well, and I think that gets lost in the conversation. We forget that's that's part of our self determination. Yeah. Right. When we bring in those words of of Ahantagariwadekwa, we're bringing in the voices of all those fishes, the birds, the trees. We're bringing them in because we're representing them as our clans. I'm a turtle, so you know I I, I have to bring in those turtles to the discussion, um, and and so it's it's really really simple but we've made it complicated. Well, thank you for sharing that. And hopefully um, 
people will listen to this podcast with an open mind and open heart and consider some of the things that were said and we can continue this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, thank you again for everything that you do. Thank you to all the listeners for tuning in to the Warrior Life podcast, for listening to the grassroots warriors, for listening to the voices of our elders and women and people who are doing their best to help educate, to help inform, um, and to learn from one another. It's really important that we help uplift these voices. And you can help uplift these voices by sharing this podcast far and wide, by sharing the videos that get posted on YouTube of these podcasts far and wide, and by remembering to have the conversation in a place of respect, love, compassion, and in our traditional ways. And I'll make sure to post links to uh, Ellen's social media, uh, links to the United Nations Declaration itself, to Bill C-15, and um, so that you can all inform yourselves about what's going on and support us as we go forward. Nyawen, Walalan, Ellen, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Pam. Till next time, keep living a warrior life, Walaliag.